Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet, brought to you by Chesterfield, America's most popular two-way cigarette. Chesterfield king size at the new low price, and Chesterfield regular. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. For a week, you've been on rolling stakeout looking for a gang of thieves. There's no sign of them. On the way back to the office, you get a 211 call. Your job? Investigate. There are more than 60 million cigarette smokers in America who smoke many brands. In choosing your cigarette, be sure to remember this. You will like Chesterfield best because only Chesterfield has the right combination of the world's best tobaccos. Tobaccos that are highest in quality, low in nicotine. Best for you. All of us smoke for relaxation, for comfort, for satisfaction. And in the whole wide world, no cigarette satisfies like a Chesterfield. Get a carton of Chesterfields today. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. Both at the same price in most places. This is the best. Chesterfield. And the time to change today. They've got the taste and they've got mildest. Millions all agree. They're low in nicotine and they're the highest quality. 30 years research went into this great cigarette. So here is all you say to get the finest smoking yet. Chesterfield's for me. Chesterfield's for me. You just say it's Chesterfield's for me. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, October 9th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out a robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Thad Brown. My name's Friday. We were on our way back to the office when a 211 robbery call came in, and it was 12.18 a.m. when we got to the corner of Oxford and Barton Avenue. The Moyles Bar and Grill. The officer back there. Yeah. Something I can do for you? Friday and Smith, Central Robbery. Sorensen, Unit 6 L86. Did you answer the call here? Yeah, I'm a partner in me. He's on the other side of the place. What do you got? A couple of guys and a woman shot. My partner's with him now. Uh-huh. One of them's one of the hold-up men. Yeah. Did you get a description? Yeah, just put it out. All right. guy that owns the place is back there if you want to talk to him. Yeah, we do. Did he witness the shooting? Yeah. Mr. Moyle? Yeah? These men would like to talk to you. This is Sergeant Friday, Officer Smith. How do you do, sir? How are you? How do you do? Anything more you need me for, Sergeant? No, that's all, thanks. We'll check the vicinity, see if we can come up with anything for you. Good. You guys will handle the crime report, will you? Yeah. Right. Frank, you want to check with the ambulance crew while I talk to Moyles here? Yeah, sure. You want to tell me what happened? I just told the other officer about it. Isn't that enough? Well, we'd like to get the story from you. Uh, do you mind if we go over and sit down? The whole thing's been a strain. Surely. This all right here? Mm-hmm. All right, sir. You want to start? First off, I'd like to ask you a question. Well, what's that? Do I look like a weakling to you? Well, it's kind of hard to say, sir. Not at all. Simple arithmetic. I'm 5'10", 185, never run from a fight in my life. Uh-huh. Working a bar, you handle some pretty tough ones. Loud mouths, guys that are trying to make time with some girl. You meet them all. Mm-hmm. Never had trouble with any of the rough times. Stood up and was counted. Yes, sir. You could just tell us about the shooting. Here. Just what I'm getting to. First time in my life I wanted to dig a hole in the floor. Got to me. Mm-hmm. I told you I'm not a coward, but when them bullets started going around, I wanted out. O-U-T. Yes, sir, I understand. Now, I suppose you tell me what happened here. Around 11.30, there are only a couple of people in the place. Young couple over here having coffee. And Elaine and George. Who are they? Two of the people who were shot. George Traber and Elaine Cronin. They're regulars. I see. They're sitting here having a beer. We're talking. Uh Uh-huh. Almost every night, Elaine comes in after work. She's a waitress. Nice girl. Real sensible. What about Traber? He's a security guard at some kind of plant out in the valley. Aircraft, I think. Not sure about it. All right. Do you want to go ahead? We're all three talking when these two guys come in. 
First, I thought it was somebody for a belt. Mm -hmm. I know most of the people in the neighborhood. Never saw these two before. Yes, sir. Come in and order a drink. I gave it to them. And they paid. Yeah. Dirty trick. Well, how do you mean that? Gave me a five. Drinks came to a buck twenty. Big guy picked up his chains, left 80 on the bar. Figured it was a tip. Picked it up. Going to drop it in the glass. Yeah. No sooner turn around, the little guy pulls a gun. Points it right at me. Yeah. Tells me it's a stick-up. Guy with him runs over to the door to cover it. Mm -hmm. Little man moves down the bar and tells George and Elaine to stay where they are and they won't get hurt. Then he turns around to me and says for me to empty the register. I did what he said. Yes, yeah, sir. Now, the other man was by the door all this time, was he? Yeah. Just standing there. I guess he wanted to check the other side of the place. Two kids had left. Wasn't anybody there. Mm -hmm. All the time I was standing there hoping that nobody had started anything. Yeah. Joe? Yeah. What do you got? Ambulance just left. Took all three of them in. Sorensen's with a suspect. How they doing? The only guy they found up front's not doing too good. Hit in the stomach. Mm -hmm. Other fellow shot up pretty bad, but none of the wounds looked serious. The girl was hit in the right leg. Not too bad. Anything else? Well, near as I can figure, the guy who was shot in the stomach is one of the holdup men. Checks out with what I got from the owner. He say anything? Uh-uh. The tenant said they'd call us from the hospital as soon as we could talk to him. All right. We better get in touch with the officer down there and make sure there's somebody with him all the time. Yeah. I got the two guns involved. 32 automatic, 38 police special. All right. Found the 32 in the suspect's hand. Okay. You want to call the office, have somebody stay with the suspect? I better get back to the owner. Right. That other cop tell you anything? No, sir, not much. Now, if you want to go ahead with your story. I thought maybe you had some kind of clue or something to tell you who the other two were. There were three of them? Yeah. Two in here. The other one was out in the car. Didn't come in at all. Mm -hmm. Did you see the person driving the car? Not good. I told the other cops about it. Could even tell if it was a man or not. What do you mean? Might have been a girl with one of those new short haircuts. I just got a glance when they drove off. I see. You want to go on about what happened in the bar? Well, after this one guy told me it was a holdup, I gave him the money. I didn't want any trouble. Mm -hmm. I put the currency on the bar and the little fella stuffed it into his pockets. I thought they'd leave after that. Might have if I hadn't started to laugh. How's that? I started to laugh. I guess it was the tension and all, but when I opened the register, I looked right at the frame hanging over it. First dollar I took in. Yeah. This was my first holdup. I got to thinking about what I could hang up to show for it. About the only thing would be a frame full of nothing. It struck me real funny. Little fella got real sore, wanted to know what the big joke was. Yeah. I couldn't tell him. More he asked, funny the whole thing got. That's when he started to look around to see if there was some kind of private joke. Mm -hmm. George and Elaine must have thought I was nuts. Yeah. Lane tried to wave to me and tell me to be quiet. That's when the guy saw the watch she was wearing. Well, what happened? Told her to take it off. Got real nasty about it. Guess he was sore about me laughing. Mm -hmm. She did like he said. As soon as I saw that, I got mad. Real mad. Yeah. I thought about what I could do. I don't keep a gun in the place. All I could lay my hands on was a wet bar rag. What was that? A wet bar rag. Oh, I see. So I did what the guy told me. Put my hands on a bar right out in plain sight. Mm -hmm. The little fella started to back out of the bar, and that's when George went into action. How do you mean that? He's a security guard. You know, I told you that. Oh, yeah, I see. Well, he carries this gun. He pulled it out and reached around the lane and blasted at the holdup man. Hit him right in the stomach. Guy kind of turned like he was going to run, then fell right on his face. Mm -hmm. Then the big guy, the one at the door, he aimed his gun and shot at George. Was the girl still in front of him? Not exactly. You see, when George shot at the one guy, he knocked Elaine down. Wasn't fast enough, though. First shot from the big one caught Elaine in the leg. Second one got George. Well, what were you doing all this time? I was still there with my hands on the bar whole thing happened so fast, there wasn't anything I could do. Just stood there. Uh -huh. Right after that, the big guy ran out of the place. I jumped over the bar and went after him. Guess I forgot there wasn't any way I could stop him. Didn't think of that. Good thing I didn't catch him. Yeah. You followed the man out on the street, did you? Yeah. Saw him jump into the car and take off. That's when I saw the other person. You know the one who was driving. Yes, sir. Did you get a good look at the car? Saw it drive off. I understand, but did you see the license plate? Yeah. But not so I could tell you the number. Was it the California plate? Yeah, I could see that. All right, now about the car itself. Can you tell me what kind it was? Nash sedan. I think it might have been a 1953. Can't be sure about that, though. Might have been a new one. What color, do you remember? Near as I can remember, it was kind of light tan. All right, sir. Can you give me a description of the big man, the one who stood at the door? Well, I gave it to that other cop. Well, yes, sir, but I'd like to go over it again with you if it's all right. Sure. As long as it'll help you get the fellas. All right, how old was he? Well, I'd say 20-something. Anywhere between 24 and 27. Mm -hmm. How about his height? Tall one, over six feet. Didn't come real close except when he was sitting. I couldn't pin it down for you, but I'd say over six feet for sure. All right, sir. About his weight? 180. Dark or light? Light. Had light hair and blue eyes. Hair was wavy. You could almost say the guy was too pretty, like some kind of advertisement, you know, for hair oil or something. Mm -hmm. What was he wearing? Had on dark pants and coat. Wore a dark shirt and a white tie. Remember that, because you don't see that combination much nowadays. 
Back in the 30s, it was all a go. Mm-hmm. You're sure about the shirt and tie? Positive. Real contrast. Dark shirt and white tie. All right. Was he clean shaven? Yeah. Talk to the business office, Joe. They're sending a team over to the hospital. That's good. Stop and talk to the men in 6L86. They checked the neighborhood. Didn't come up with anything. Mm-hmm. What about Elaine? Is she going to be all right? Yes, sir. She's not hurt seriously. Sure. Glad of that. Felt bad about not doing anything to help her, but I'm the kind of guy, when I cut my finger, I can't even put a bandage on it myself. Mm-hmm. Always been like that. Yeah. What kind of gun did the man at the door have, do you remember? Looked like a forty-five automatic. I see. Mm-hmm. Descriptions check out. Yeah. Type of guns are the same, too. You know these men? Well, we've got an idea who they are, yes, sir. We've been after them for some time now. Sure wish I could have given you more. This is all over in a few minutes. Well, you've helped us quite a bit already, Mr. Moyle. At the time, it seemed longer than a Monday when there's been too much Sunday. Yeah. These guys done this kind of thing before? Well, we think so. They've been hitting theaters. This is the first time they've hit a cafe. Hope it's going to be the last. Way they put the B on George and Elaine, like see you get them. Well, we're going to try. If you do, could you do me a favor? What's that? Well, I kind of goofed it up when they were here before. I'd like another chance at the big guy when he hadn't got his gun. Well, I'm afraid we can't do that. Moyle is a police business. Why not? He's bigger than me. Yes, sir. Be a fair fight, wouldn't it? For the past six weeks, on Tuesday and Thursday nights, three people had been hitting theaters in the central Hollywood area. Descriptions obtained from the victims were the same in each case. Rolling stakeouts had been set up without result. Runs by the stats office had been checked out, and we were still no nearer to our suspects. In each case, the method of operation was the same. Two men would enter a theater box office and rob the cashier of all currency, and then leave in a car driven by a third person. We'd been unable to establish whether the person in the car was male or female. None of the victims had been able to give us a good description. However, in all of the holdups, the car the suspects used was the same. The robbery of the cafe and the shooting of the two witnesses gave us our first concrete lead to the identity of the suspects. The description of the smaller man matched the one we'd gotten in the theater jobs. From what the bar owner told us, it was more than possible that he was one of the bandits that we'd been looking for. We recovered the ejected shell casings and the spent bullets. They were booked as evidence. At 1.56 a.m., Frank and I left Moyle's Bar and Grill and drove over to George Street Receiving Hospital. We talked to Dr. Hall. He told us that the two victims were receiving treatment and would recover. From personal effects, the suspect was identified as Carl Layden. We called the business office and made arrangements for his home to be checked. Dr. Hall told us that the man was in serious condition, but that we might be able to question him. We went into the treatment room. Layden was under heavy drugs. Layden? Layden? Yeah? These men want to talk to you. Well, tell them to go away. I don't want to talk to anybody. Tell them. Layden, we want to ask you about tonight. You a cop? That's right. You tell me something. What's that? How bad is it? They're doing what they can. You lost a lot of blood. Am I going to make it? We don't know. Mm-hmm. Now, who are the other two, Layden? I don't know. They left you alone. You don't owe them anything. Now, who are they? Come on, Layden. How about the one in the car? What's the name? They walked out on me, didn't they? That's right. Now, what are the names? How about it, Layden? Oh, Norberg. He's one of them. N-O-R-B-E-R-G? Yeah, uh, Sam Norberg. Has he done any big time? Uh, I don't think so. Which one is he, Layden? The one in the bar? The driver. How about the blonde? What's his name? Layden? Wait a minute, Jeff. Yeah, you're going to have to stop. No more questions. He's too weak. All right. We'll be outside, Doctor. I'll be right with you. Right. What do you think? I don't know. It's a good lead. Yeah. You got a name. Let's find out. Where is it? Huh? Mm. Better run it through, I guess. Try to come up with an address. Hope he's not the kind of guy who changes it three or four times a year. Well, if he is, we can help him. Yeah. We'll give him a new one. a.m., Frank and I went back to the office. We contacted the team who checked Carl Layden's apartment. They told us they'd found nothing to help us in apprehending the other two suspects. A stakeout was set up on the place. We ran the name Sam Norberg through R&I, but we failed to turn a record on anyone answering his description. Frank checked the phone book in the city directory. We came up with two possibles. We asked Sergeant Bud Young and Officer Serrani from the business office to help us. 
2.47 a.m., we got to the first address, 713 Larchmont Boulevard. It was a small bungalow. A tan 1953 Nash was parked in the driveway. The doors were locked and the radiator was still warm. While Young and Siriani covered the rear of the house, Frank and I went up to the front door. The car makes it look good. Yeah, you want to get the door? Probably asleep. Mm. Somebody coming now. Yeah. Who is it? Sam Norberg. Well, what do you want? We want to talk to you. Police officers. You guys know what time it is? All right, move over. Right now. Get this over fast. I got to get some sleep. Here. I can't stay up half the night answering questions. Right, stand still. He's clean. Well, it must be real important to come around this late. It is. Anybody else in the house? No, I got enough trouble trying to feed myself. Well, you won't mind if we look around. Make a difference if I did? No, not much. I figured that. Go ahead. Check out back. Tell them it's okay, huh? Yeah. Got the place surrounded? We expect to find the Purple Gang. I wonder if you're as good with the answers as you are at the questions. Look, you might think I'm a foul ball, but I don't know what you're after. I'll have to hand you this. Yeah. You guys must have me mixed up with somebody else. You're Sam Norberg, aren't you? Yeah. Well, we didn't knock on the wrong door. Okay, Joe. Place checks out clean. Did you talk to Young and Sirianni? Yeah, they'll wait for us. I told them this one looked good. Mm -hmm. I don't want to rush you, fellas, but you want to tell me what this is all about? That's your car out in the driveway? Yeah, why? You got the keys then, huh? On the table there. All right. You want to get dressed? Well, four. I'm not going anyplace. You keep believing that, but get your clothes on. I got a coat in the closet. Point it out. We'll get it. There's only one there. Right here. <sighs> now let's go. These the keys? You see any more? I don't know what this is all about. Well, you find out you made a mistake, don't apologize. I just go away so I get me some sleep. Yeah, sure. You stand right there. That badge makes you a big man, doesn't it? You better it? keep your mouth closed. You're going to find you're in the wrong league here, mister. I'll check the registration. Okay. There's no reason to do that. I own the car. How about it? Mm. It's got his name on it. Well, whose did you think you'd find? You come up with anything, I'll split with you. Anything else? Wait a minute. Take a look. Norberg, you know a Carl Layden? Never heard of him. You sure about that? I told you. And this is your car? Huh? Well, you know that. Well, then maybe you can explain this. What? This driver's license. What about it? Belongs to Carl Layden. are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Today, one-way cigarettes, one size, that is, are almost obsolete because they just don't give smokers what they want. Either way, you like Chesterfield best. It's America's most popular two-way cigarette because only Chesterfield gives you the right combination of the world's best tobaccos. Tobaccos that are highest in quality, low in nicotine. Best for you. All of us smoke for relaxation, for comfort, for satisfaction. And in the whole wide world, no cigarette satisfies like a Chesterfield. You smoke with the greatest possible pleasure when your cigarette is Chesterfield. Get a carton of Chesterfields. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. Both at the same price in most places. This is the best. Chesterfield. And the time to change today. We made a thorough search of Sam Norberg's house, but we failed to turn up anything more to tie him in with the robberies. He was taken downtown to the city hall for questioning. 4.30 a.m. Where'd you first meet Layden? I don't even know. Well, then you can tell us how his driver's license turned up in your car, can't you? No, I can't tell you. You said it was your car. Yeah. It was locked when we found it. That's pretty smart figuring. Well, I hope you're going to do some now. What's that supposed to mean? I don't know how long you think you're going to be able to keep this up. We got you nailed and you know it. Now, why don't you tell us what we want to know and we can all go home and get some sleep. i sure like to help you, but I don't even know what you're talking about. Layden says he knows you. When'd he say that? Tonight. Said you drove the car for him and the other guy. Where'd you see him? Layden? Yeah. Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. He's unhappy with you boys. Figures you ran out on him. Willing to fill us in on the whole deal. With him on our side and the witnesses to the robbery tonight, you're in real trouble, Norbert. This on the level? Right down the line. I heard Layden didn't make it. 
You heard wrong. He wants to put in a call so you can talk to him? It's a lousy deal. Clint told me he was dead. Clint's the blonde fellow, isn't he? Yeah, Clint Purnell. Told me all about how Layden didn't make it to the door of the place. Said he went right out. Well, that's not right. I'll check R and I. Okay. That lousy Clint. You know where he is? No, if I did, I'd give it to you. When did you see him last? Tonight. I dropped him off downtown. Where? Fifth and Spring. Said he had a big day. Uh-huh. Should have known not to trust Clint. Yeah. Here you got a cigarette? Here. Thanks. Help yourself. How long you known for now? I don't know. A couple of months. Where'd you meet him? A bar out on First Street. Lady and me used to go there all the time. Uh-huh. Lady and me have been good friends for a long time. We'd never been in trouble before we met Clint. Purnell set up the deal? Yeah. He started to talk to us about we could pick up some easy money. He laid out the whole idea. Lady and me told him we'd never been hung up in anything like it before. Mm -hmm. He said he knew enough for all of us. Clint's a pretty good talker. Guess it don't make a lot of difference, though. We could have said no. Where's Purnell live? At a place out on Venice Boulevard. You got an address? No, but I can show you where it is. How'd you do? I don't think we've got it. Take a look at these. Mm -hmm. Is this the Clint Purnell you're talking about? Yeah, that's him. He's older than that and all. Mm-hmm. He's better looking in person than he is in that picture. Well, he probably had an off day. Well, his clothes make him look different, too. The dark shirts. You always wear them, does he? Yeah, I never saw him anything else. He asked me one day why I always wore a white shirt. He said it was square. Mm -hmm. Asked me how long I could wear a white shirt. I told him one day. Yeah. He says I'm crazy. Big deal about how he can wear a dark shirt three or four days in the dirt. Don't show on the collar. Yeah. Thinks people don't know the difference. They can tell. How many theater jobs did you go on? Five. How come you switched to cafes? That was Clint's idea. Said you might have the show staked out. Mm -hmm. Everything we did, he planned it. We asked about something, he said not to worry about it. He had it all figured. Yeah. All we said, he was as smart as any cop. Kept telling us you made mistakes. We do. Well, that's what he said. He should have told you the rest of it. What do you mean? We can make them more than once. We took Sam Norberg down to the carpool and we drove him out on Venice Boulevard. He pointed out the rooming house where Clint Purnell lived. While I waited with Norberg, Frank went up to check with the manager. In a couple of minutes, he came back. That looks like we missed it. What do you mean? Manager says Purnell was here about 2.30. Yeah. Packed his bags and left. Frank and I, along with the suspect, went up and looked over the room. Apparently, Purnell had left in a hurry. We talked to the manager, but he was unable to tell us where the suspect had gone. He did tell us that Purnell had driven up to the place in a car and after packing his belongings had left. The manager went on to say that he knew the suspect didn't own an automobile himself and that he'd gotten the license number of the car in the event that there might be any trouble. We called the Department of Motor Vehicles and we found that the car was registered to a Mrs. Robert Sherburn, 297 Colorado Boulevard. Frank and I went back to the main jail and booked Sam Norberg in on suspicion of robbery. After that, we drove out to talk to the Sherburn woman. The address was a writing academy in Griffith Park. We left the car down the street and walked onto the grounds. Wonder what the pitch is. Hmm? Purnell driving a car registered to a Mrs. Sherburn. I don't know. Guess this is the office, huh? That's what the sign says. I'm so beat I'm having trouble seeing the building, let alone the sign. I don't know. It's kind of early. Maybe no one's up. There's got to be somebody around. Let's try it again. Yeah. Yes? Miss Sherburn? That's right. Police officers. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. What's wrong? How do you do, ma'am? We'd like to ask you a couple of questions about it's Robert, your car. isn't it? Something's happened to Robert. No, ma'am. You don't have to lie to me. I know that's it. Robert smashed up the car and he's been hurt. No, ma'am, that's not it. You know a man named Clint Purnell? It's not about my husband? No. Oh, that's a relief. He left for Bakersfield this morning and I thought there'd been an accident. Mm -hmm. I was scared. Like when you're baking a cake and somebody slams the door, you have to check the oven, but you're afraid to look and you're afraid not to. <laughs> you, you know how that is. Yes, ma'am. Now about Clint Purnell. Do you know him? Oh, yes, I do. He's my stepbrother. Is that why you're here? What's that? Is Clint in trouble again? We'd like to talk to him. I guess I should have known it. Clint never comes around unless he's in trouble. You seen him then? Yes, he came by last night. Said he wanted to borrow the station wagon to pick up his stuff. He said he was going back east because he couldn't make a go of it here on the coast. Do you know where he is now? Yes. He's back in the tack room. Said he didn't have any place to sleep and I'd let him use the cot in there. All right. What kind of trouble is he in this time? It'd be better if we talk to him. Well, whatever it is, I'm not going to stand behind him. He promised me. He promised Robert. If he's running again, he isn't going to get any help from us. All right. Where is this tack room? Back there. It's the second door. Thank you. I hope there isn't going to be any trouble. Well, if there is, he'll have to start it. Go 
I'll try the door. Yeah. All right, let's go. What are you doing? All right, Fernell, come on, get up. What are you doing come in here? here? Pete. Well, you, you got no right to come in here like this. Right, get your hands around here. I'll shake it. All right. Stand still. He's clean, Joe. You want to check the bed? Yeah. You guys got a lot of nerve busting in here like this. No reason for it. Yeah, sure. 45 automatic under his pillow. Big deal. So you found a gun. What's that proof? You carry him, too. Yeah, but there's a big difference, mister. Is that right? Yeah, we get paid for it. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 20th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, I smoke Chesterfields because I sincerely believe they're the best cigarette ever made. And I wish you'd give them a try, too. Not because I like them, but because you will. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. They satisfy millions. <laughs> Samuel Garland Norberg, Carl Franklin Layton, and Clinton Ward Purnell were tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, five counts, and assault with intent to commit murder, one count. They received sentence as prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than five years. Assault with intent to commit murder is punishable by imprisonment for a period of from one to 14 years. Today, you're needed for the defense of your country. Teenagers, men and women of all ages, sign up for the silver wings of the Ground Observer Corps. Be the eyes that guard the blind spots in our aerial defenses. Contact your nearest Civil Defense Center for full information. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Ben Morris, Herb Ellis, Virginia Gregg. Script by John Robinson, Earl Schley. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, Gunsmoke, brought to you by L&M Filters, will now be heard on Saturday night. Chesterfield's Perry Como show will be heard Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights. Consult your radio listings for the time. That's Gunsmoke and the Como Show, both on another network. L and M filters are sweeping the country, and the reason's simple. No filter compares with L and M's exclusive miracle tip for quality or for effectiveness. And notice how easy it draws. You get much more flavor, much less nicotine. Yes, only L and M gives you effective filtration, and no other cigarette has it. Our statement of quality goes unchallenged. L&M is America's highest quality and best filter tip cigarette. Buy L&M's, now king size or regular, both at the same low price. Radio Theater presents The Turning Point tonight on the NBC Radio Network.